Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome back to our second afternoon of science and career lecture series. For today, for our agenda this afternoon, we will have two inspiring talks on the biotech and pharmaceutical industry, which we will conclude with a career support talk after the panel discussion. Okay, for those who were not here yesterday, so this webinar is sponsored by the um, SCI or Society of Chemical Industry. So I just want to say a few words about SCI. So the SCI Scotland group has a diverse membership, and this is based on the industry presence in Scotland, which we can describe that the chemical sciences sector accounts for 17% of Scotland's total exports. <clears throat> So we also have members coming from the agricultural sciences and the large sector on the physical and biological sciences as well, despite the name of the organization. So throughout the year, we, the Scotland Group, have supported and organized a range of events from the successful days of science and career like this one we're having right now. And we've organized this around Scotland. So one time it was in Aberdeen, it could be in Edinburgh or in Inverness. And this year it's in Glasgow, but we're doing it as a webinar or an online um, event. So, <clears throat> so we don't only have this event, but we also have like writing competitions. So the Scotland group, we also organize prestigious lectures. Okay. And um, not only eminent scientists from the um, chemistry, chemical scientists, but as well as the biological sciences. So this is the Tennant Award and the Lister Memorial Lectures. So as our motto says, SCI were science meet business. So we aim to foster links between employees within the science sector and academia alike which means using this motto, we are supporting and providing events for students and early career researchers, in addition to those more established in the fields. So next slide, please. So for our agenda this afternoon, we'll have two inspiring talks, as I've already said, on biotech, that is from Dr. Alison Arnold and from GSK, Gordon Shearer, and we'll conclude that with a career career support talk from Dr. Emma Compton. So without further ado, we will start with Dr. Alison Arnold. So Dr. Alison is head of the fermentation group from Ingenza. So she's based, uh, or Ingenza is based at the Roslyn Innovation Center. So let us find out how Alison built her career, career with an SME that has been growing and progressing through the decades since it was founded. Thanks, Ruan. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Alison Arnold, and I work at Ingenza, who are a biotechnology company based just outside Edinburgh. And I gave my talk the title of, of the unintentional microbiologist this afternoon. And you'll see as I go through my slides why I called the talk this. Firstly, just to give a little bit of a background to where I currently work at Ingenza Limited. So, so who are we? Well, we're a world leader in the application of industrial biotechnology and synthetic biology. And as I mentioned before, um, we're based in Roslyn, just outside Edinburgh. We were founded in 2003. And when I, I actually joined in 2003, when I joined, there was four of us and now there's 40 of us we've got a diverse range of backgrounds in synthetic organic chemistry, molecular biologists, biochemists and fermentation scientists, and a few non-scientific staff as well. So that's a little bit about where I currently am. So I, and I'm sorry, this is just where Ingenza got their name. It's a little bit of industrial genetics enzymes with, with an A on the end. So I thought I'd then go back and talk a little bit about myself and how I got from the start of my career to where I am today. So in my current role, um, I'm head of the fermentation department. So I'm basically responsible um, for, for all fermentations and scale up fermentation processes within Ingenza. And like I said before, I joined in 2003, so that's nearly 18 years ago. And when I joined, there was only four of us. 
and uh, now there's 40 of us. So I've been on quite a journey with the company. So that question that you always get asked when you're younger, so what do you want to do when you grow up? That's a really hard question to answer. And uh, basically, if you ask my 10 year old self what I wanted to do, I probably wanted to be an Olympic athlete. So I put up a picture of Sally Gunnell winning her uh, gold in Barcelona in 92. That might be before some of you were born, but she was a bit of an inspiration to me. I did a lot of running at the time. And if in a different world, that's probably what I wanted to be. But in the real world, I was never good enough to be an Olympic athlete. So then the other thing I was always very keen on becoming was a vet, um, mainly because of um, my love of animals and especially dogs. But as I kind of grew up, I started to realize that probably I couldn't put animals down and it wasn't really for me. So these were some of the answers that I give when people, adults would ask me what I wanted to be. Then as I kind of got through school, I probably was thinking about maybe I wanted to do a PE teacher, to be a PE teacher. But I was also quite sciencey in the school were trying to push me a bit more into something a bit more academic than, um, than sporting. So sort of went away from that and started to slowly go down the kind of the, the science avenue. My kind of interest in science, it was always there. Um, so it really kind of started when I started doing higher, I did higher chemistry um, and, and I really in, enjoyed it. Um, I had a good teacher and I also really liked maths at school. And there's quite a lot of um, maths involved in chemistry. And again, I had a really good maths teacher. So I definitely think some of the choices I made when I was younger were quite influenced by teachers in school. So I started off doing a higher in chemistry. I then went on to do a certificate in six year studies in chemistry, which now is called an advanced hire, but I'm, I'm old. So that's what it was called back then. And um, but I still had this kind of biology sort of maybe it came from kind of my interest in the body and sport. Um, I still had this kind of bio, biology interest, so I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to do a pure chemistry degree, so actually I applied to do biochemistry. So I started off doing a BSc in biochemistry at the University of Aberdeen. Um, again, because I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do, and that seemed like a fairly good broad degree that would get me into something kind of maybe sports or science related. But um, as I went through university, at the end of my second year, I was doing all the subjects for both biochemistry and chemistry, but I felt that I was kind of more interested in chemistry. And I remember having a conversation with my mum at the time, really unsure, should I stick with biochemistry or chemistry? And she, she gave me some good advice. She said to me, well, if you do chemistry, you can probably always become a biochemist, but it might be hard if you just do biochemistry to then become a, a pure chemist. So I went with her advice and I then I switched halfway through my degree course to do a BSc in chemistry. And then at the end of university, I wasn't really sure um, what I wanted to do. So what I actually decided to do was just take a bit of time out. Um, I'd saved up quite a lot of money and um, I... I uh, unfortunately, there'd been a, a death in the family, so I had got a little bit of extra cash and I applied for a work visa for um, New Zealand. So I went off travelling for a year and I did a lot of growing up and thinking in that time. Did I want to stay in science? Did I want to do something else? But also what that year gave me was confidence. It was meeting new people um, going to new places, having new experience because Workplace isn't just about being good at your, uh, your the subject that you do or the area you work in. It's being able to communicate with others from a whole range of different backgrounds. So actually, for me personally, in terms of my career, although that wasn't directly related to science, I really felt that it, it helped me. And you'll see later in the slides that through my work, I've had to travel a lot. So I'm quite happy to just go places where I don't know people. And um, it was never a problem. So then. When I came back from traveling, it was a big question of, do I get a job or, or, or do, I, do I do a PhD? So an opportunity came up um, at the University of Strathclyde and it was working actually as a research assistant. So it was a job and it was in collaboration with a number of um, industrial companies, Eli Lilly, a British biotech um, 
and it was looking at near infrared spectroscopy to monitor industrial bioprocesses. So they wanted ideally to hire a chemist because it was near infrared spectroscopy, so it was analysis, but it was looking at it applied to microorganisms, so looking at E. coli and Streptomyces fredii, and the British biotech was Pachypastorus and Cho cells. So here was my chemistry background, kind of meeting, meeting the biology that I'd always toyed with being interested in. Um, and then it was also in collaboration with FOSS who made the NIR systems. So at the time um, of the interview, although it was, it was a three year post, so it was a job and I asked if I would be able to write up the work that I'd done as a PhD, um, kind of in my own time. So actually for me, it was the perfect hybrid of doing a job, but also being able to have the option to write the work up as a PhD. So yeah, I completed my PhD with snappy title of the use of atline and online near infrared spectroscopy to monitor industrial microbi microbial bioprocesses. So I did that for three years and then I really needed a break. So I went off traveling again to different further flung places. Um, I went before I'd just been kind of in Australia, America and in places like Fiji. This time I went off to Asia. And again, like I said before, I felt this really helped me um, gain confidence. And the other thing, I also had a job lined up for when I came back. So um, money was less pressured this time. And when I came back, I had decided to stay on as a postdoc at Strathclyde University to collaborate on a project with DSM, who were based in Delft in the Netherlands. And this was working on the continuous culture of aspergillus for the production of enzymes. So here already my career was kind of shifting through the course of my PhD and into in my postdoc from chemistry into kind of microbiology and this a postdoc was taking me further down the kind of microbiology route away from the chemistry. Um, so to go back and talk a little bit about the history um, of Ingenza and how it relates to, to what I do today and how my background actually really helped me get the job at Ingenza. So originally um, Ingenza was a spin-out company of the chemistry department at the University of Edinburgh. So when I joined in 2003 we were Based, we had basically one lab and one set of offices in the chemistry department in one, in one corner. So we were there for, for three years, um, but we basically outgrew the space. So then um, in 2007, we moved to the Wallace Building, which was part of the Roslyn Biocenter, which is uh, just outside Roslyn. And we were there for 10 years. And we probably needed to move from a space point of view, but we, we would have potentially stayed there, but they had the site earmarked for for new houses. So we were, we were forced to move. So in 2018, um, we moved to a brand new building um, at Bush Estate. So just beside the Roslyn um, Institute and opposite, opposite the vet school. And this is a picture here um, of the building with it. It's got one of it, like a mini Kelpie outside. So it was, it was purpose built um, for us. And we were able to, the good thing about that, we were able to design the labs in a way that suited us. And uh, here's just a picture of um, the labs and our offices. And then um, this is me showing various people around on, on, on our open day. So a little bit about Ingenza and, and what we are and what we do and what my role specifically within the company is. So as I mentioned before, we're an industrial biotechnology and synthetic biology company. So we have core competencies in molecular biology, microbiology and chemistry. and what that means is that we can do strain construction and we've got um, a proprietary technology called Enable that allows us to put bits of DNA together quite quickly. We can do protein expression and enzyme evolution. We can do um, microbial scale up or microbial fermentations from what's well, actually smaller than two litres up to 2.6 million litres, cell culture, bioprocess development, downstream processing. And because we've got a chemistry team, we can do some synthetic chemistry as well. So here's an example or, or a question that we're often asked is um, typically who are our customers? So our customers can be chemical companies looking to source capabilities in micro and molecular biology that they might be un unfamiliar with. And um, they might be used um, to working on pure chemistry process and we can help them change that process to be a kind of bio-based chemical process. 
or, or working with biofuel companies. They can be um, therapeutic companies um, or they can be academics um, that are, have a good idea and we can work with them to take their idea from proof of concept. Um, an example of that where we've worked with um, two companies is PFP, which is listed here as Profat to Pharma, and another one that I've not got listed called Amprologics, where we basically helped a, an academic group um, set up, spin out and start up companies, and, and we took um, a percentage of um, shares in that company. So because we're small, we're pretty flexible with how we can work with people, and it means that we can help companies um, take their process from the beginning with the kind of molecular biology strain construction right the way through the fermentation to the finish and the downstream process um, product isolation. So just a little bit more about the um, different departments. We have molecular biology, fermentation and chemistry. And one thing that's relatively or is a kind of a unique selling point of ours, because we've got a, a devoted chemistry team, it means if we're doing uh, redesigning of pathways in, in microorganisms that and if there's some of the intermediates that are not commercially available we can synthesize them because we've got a team of um, chemists. So like I mentioned before my career I started off as a chemist and now I'm kind of more of a microbiologist but that actually works quite well it means having a background in one subject and working on another subject actually really helps when you're working together in a big multidisciplinary team like that. So when you're starting your career, try not to pigeonhole yourself into one thing or another, because it's always flexible in what you can do. And actually, even within Ingenza itself, we've had people who started off in the molecular biology group and, and showed a keen interest in joining the fermentation team. So, you know, pe people have been able to, to move about um, within the company as well. So specifically fermentation at Ingenza, so we've got host expertise, so this isn't just, um, this can be fermentation, but also strain construction and a whole heap of different microorganisms here. So here our go-to microorganism is often uh, E. coli because there's lots of um, previous work out there. It's quite um, easy to, to clone and put together and, and easier to ferment compared to other sub other microorganisms, but we're also diversified and we've got a lot of expertise in Saccharomyces um, and other yeast like Pickia and then other more complicated bacteria like Streptomyces and then Bacillus, Pseudomonas. I'm not going to go through all of these, but as well as working um, with mi microorganisms, we also um, have a lab where we do Cho cells, so that's Chinese hamster ovarian cells. Um, they're quite different, they're sort of slower growing and um, much more sensitive than, than working with various microbes. So for me, uh, talking to you guys this afternoon is quite strange to think that I started off as chemistry in chemistry and I wouldn't even have probably known what these microorganisms are. And now these are my kind of go-to and a lot of my chemistry is, is forgotten um, or, or, or um, less at the forefront of my head. So um, what's my specific role in Genza? of what, what, what do um, I do? So basically fermentation team sits in the middle of the molecular biology and the chemistry team. So we'll get the strains coming through from the molecular biologist and then we'll grow them up and ferment them. This is a picture of a, a little fermenter here. And then we'll give them onto the chemistry team who will isolate the product. So I always like to make this kind of analogy here. If, if this is a football team, we're like the uh, midfield who kind of do all the work and then we give it to the chemists who isolate the product and uh, get all the glory. So it's like they score the goals. But like I mentioned before, it is a big team effort. Um, so over the years, um, I personally and, and my team have got experience in lots of different microorganisms, bacterial yeast, fungi, mammalian, and we've scaled various of the various processes of these up um, with partners, different scales, so up to 50,000 litres for uh, some of the bacteria here and some of our, our biofuel work, up to 2.6 million litres. So you can, can't even get your head around how big that is. It's just the fermenters are enormous and then lots of different other microorganisms as well. We've also done some gas fermentation um, 
up to five litres. So basically, we have a broad ranging suites of microorganisms that we can develop and apply as necessary for specific projects. And um, within fermentation um, itself, there's lots of different approaches to how we can carry out this fermentation. We can carry out batch fermentation where everything goes in at the beginning. So this is fast and simple and it's like we'd often do this for a proof of concept. We can also do um, fed batch fermentation. That's basically where you keep feeding the microorganisms to keep them happy and making the product that you're interested in. So you can achieve higher biomass or higher cell density and this can be more cost effective. Um, and we can also do continuous uh, fermentation, which is, as it says on the tin, you are continuously trying to keep the microorganisms growing. And in that instance, you're putting um, fresh media in and taking spent media out. So that can often give you higher volumetric productivity and reduce capital. So all of these things, I put this slide in because um, as you kind of move through your career, you often start to realise that it's not just about getting something to work. It's also about will it work and will it work in a cost effective manner? So, you know, when you start out designing a process, um, often you're just like, can I get it to work? But actually what's almost more important is to, to think, is this going to be cost effective? Especially if you're working in an in industry, what you're doing has to be economically viable. So I think as you go through your career, you start to learn a little bit more about economics and cost modeling and things like that, probably that you didn't really touch on too much as a, an undergraduate. So you always have to be prepared to diversify and learn new things, even, even when you've been doing something for a number of years like I have. Um, and again, this links back to the, um, my traveling. And um, like I said, that personally, that helped me, but actually professionally, that really helped me because in my work at Ingenza, we've had to scale up a number of our different processes, and that's involved a lot of travel to various different countries. So we've been out to various places in the US running um, things at different scale from 10 litres up to 2.6 million litres, and this is a lot of different sorts of microorganisms. We've also been um, worked on projects within the UK um, and also in Europe and also further afield in Asia. So having experience of traveling and going to different countries, I found really useful um, that it wasn't a complete shock to go places in a work context as well. And also this is part of my job, this scale up um, that I find really, really interesting. So yeah, my daily life at Ingenza, the job description, well, it varies day to day. It can be meeting uh, potential new customers. It can be building relationships with current customers can be planning and running fermentations, supervising and training more junior staff, working closely with both molecular biology and chemistry teams at Ingenza. Um, I've got a couple of PhD super, uh, students who I'm the industrial PhD supervisor for. It can be tech transfer of processes off site. Um, it can, and then in that instance, going on site to assist the process scale up. It can be managing projects and grants. It can be talking to you guys here this afternoon about what I do, and from time to time, I'm even allowed to hobnob with politicians. Over your career, and in my career, there's been various challenges that at times you, don't, you, you, you doubt and you're not sure about. I mean, I think there's very few people when they're younger have a very clear idea of, of what it is they want to do. So you're always like, what do I want to do? I mean, as I mentioned, there was a number of things that I wanted to do. Um, and then you're like, have I made the right choice? Um, and you're quite often doubting your decision. And I just wanted to put this in for the shout out to the women and girls in the audience. Um, don't be intimidated um, by science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, we need to get more and more women interested in that. And so I'll quite often go out to schools and try and talk to girls about maths and science and chemistry. So be confident um, you're there on uh, merit. And for, as for everyone, Life outside work is, is a juggling act, especially if you've got maybe family commitments and things like that. So yeah, it's difficult and you sometimes, well, over the years I've doubted myself, have I made the right ch choices? Have I not? But there's always chances to diversify, take a step back, change course. So like I keep said at the beginning of the talk, don't pigeonhole yourself as, okay, I'm gonna do 
this degree, so I must be this. Be open to changes and, and adapting what you do. And so I don't really like um, selling this, but I, I would be in trouble for my work if I didn't put this up there, up uh, here. So in uh, 2018, unbeknown to me, Ingenza nominated me for um, an award. So it was the Scottish Women's Award for um, Services to Science and Technology. And I, I was absolutely gobsmacked um, to win it. But for me personally, I found that it was just, it was, it was nice because it, it sort of justified some of the decisions, decisions that I've made and hard choices that I've uh, made over the years. So this is me in the middle receiving that award with two of my colleagues, Rita and Lois. And I, Lois is actually another member of the fermentation team. So yeah, that was, that was, that was a nice thing uh, to get from work. And then my kind of last slide is just a description of what I was and what I am now. And it help, probably helps explain why the title of my talk was The Unintentional Microbiologist. So I would describe myself now as a former chemist, term microbiologist. Um, so former chemist, kind of term microbiologist, all these different microorganisms and uh, fermentation that I do. At points engineer, trying to uh, work out how to scale stuff up and with a, a little bit of molecular biology thrown in there. And probably a bit of uh, economics and finance uh, nowadays, which I should have probably put on the slide. So yeah, that's me. Um, these are my, this is Ingenza's contact details. I think my personal email was on the front slide. Um, feel free to ask me some questions now or in the panel discussion, or I'm always happy uh, to get emails from people at a later point. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Alison. That was a very good, inspiring talk. So I've got a couple of questions, but the rest of the questions I'm going to ask during the panel discussion. Uh, one question is, uh, wait a minute. So what chemistry and bio biological know-how would you think is essential to work with a biotechnological company like Ingenza? Um, so I, I, again, I can't speak for for all companies, but in Genza, we're quite diverse in the backgrounds of people that we hire. So we hire people who have PhDs, who are very specialised in a specific area of, say, chemistry or, or biology or molecular biology. But we also have a, a modern apprentice scheme. Um, so I probably should have maybe put in a couple of slides about that, actually, where we take school leavers who might maybe just have like some sort of hired or not even in, in a science subject. And uh, so they come in with very little science background and we train them in, internally. And then also we have a range of people with degrees, masters, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think it, it depends what the role is and, and what you're going to be doing, but you can have pretty much no science background or be very, very specialized. Oh, thank you. So I've got the follow-up question to that. So do you have to have a PhD to conduct research with Ingenza? Or do you take on people straight from undergrad? Could yeah, no, we that? take we take people from undergrad, and also within Ingenza are, you know, that we've got different levels. We've got like um, technician, research assistant, science, senior scientist, etc., team leader. Um, just because you have a PhD or 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 not doesn't stop you from getting promoted. If you just have a degree or a master's. And you know you you learn the stuff on the job or through various work experience. That has, there isn't a ceiling to where where you can go. So we have um, senior scientists at Ingenza who who don't actually have a PhD. So having a PhD for some roles is necessary, but but isn't ne totally necessary for it for everything. And one example of a girl in my team, Kirsty, she joined me ten years ago as a modern apprentice at 17 and she's here 10 years later and she's worked her way up to scientist um, from having no pretty much zero science background. Um, one more question. This is from Lisa. She was wondering if computational biology is an important skill at Ingenza. So, you know, like kind of like modeling and computers, that type of thing. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So by kind of bioinformatics, I guess. So that is something that Ingenza is often looking at, and that's probably an area that is something that we could 
we, we could be better at and it, um because it's a kind of upcoming area we have a couple of people that are, are quite good but they're sort of self self-trained and self learn but yeah no that is something that Ingenz is always interested in doing but we haven't got a kind of de dedicated team on that. Okay Susan uh, sorry uh, Lisa so you can go for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question from Susan uh, regarding fermentation do fermentation processes take several days? It depends on the microorganism so and what so some, so something like E. coli is a fast growing microorganism. So they would only take a day or so. Um, something like a mammalian cell culture, they're slower growing. So they might take um, a week or so to run. Um, and also it depends if you're running it in batch, fed batch or continuous mode. Because if you're running something in continuous mode, you're trying to run it for as long as possible, in which case that can take weeks to run. So thank you very much, Alison. I'll ask the rest of the questions coming in into our chat later on in the panel discussion. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. I'll move on to Gordon. So Gordon Shearer is a technical continuous improvement team leader, and he's responsible for delivery of step change business and process improvement projects for manufacturing processes on the GSK. Airvine site. So now we're talking about a multinational pharmaceutical company. So go ahead, Gordon. Yeah. And thank, thank you for um, accepting our invitation. Yeah, that's no problem. Thank you for inviting me along today. And I guess when I was asked to give a title of my talk, and I picked obviously been with the GSK 25 years, Alison said she felt old. I certainly feel old uh, speaking to you guys today. Um, so over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, my career background, what we do at the Irvine site, what I do within my current role and within the, the technical team, some of the career uh, opportunities at GSK, and then some of the transferable skills that I look for when, when I'm recruiting. So first of all, I'll kick off with uh, my background. So I started as a, or I graduated as a chemist in 1996. So 25 years ago, I would have been just finishing up my final exams. And I know Alison touched on there what to do at that stage. So for me, it was, do I go into industry or do I do a PhD? And I was fortunate at that stage that I did have an offer from Glaxo Welcome down in Dartford. So this was pre-GSK merger. I also had the benefit of work experience from my third year industrial placement. So it, it kind of really it opened my eyes up at that stage. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what careers were out there with a, a chemistry degree. And the work experience really gave me that um, benefit and basically made me aware of what was there. And it also gave me the opportunity to work in world-class facilities with uh, high caliber chemists. And it also gave me the opportunity to do part of my degree, which I really loved, which was organic chemistry and I was passionate about. And it, it didn't actually really feel like a job. So it, it kind of felt like a no brainer to me at that stage that moving into industry was the, the right decision. So I moved down to Dartford and I spent six years as a process R&D chemist and then also spent a final year down at uh, the Tunbridge site when we uh, reconciliated the, the, the chemical development department. So just to give a feel for where process R&D sits within the, the drug development journey, it sits between medchem and manufacturing. So in medicinal, medicinal chemistry, you'll have uh, therapeutic target molecules identified. They show some kind of therapeutic response. They then have to be scaled up so that they can then be tested in clinical trials, toxicology trials. So the key role for the process R&D team is to start to scale up the processes from MedChem to basically provide material for those trials. The other thing as well is that if the product is going to reach it to market, then you need to have a process that's economically viable and it's also going to be environmentally efficient. And that is a lengthy process. These processes can take between eight to 10 years to, to go through all of that. 
at the top right hand side here, you can see some of the range of therapies that I worked on, some of the target molecules within there. So quite a, a broad range. And I guess the nature of the business, you could be working on a project for four weeks or up to four years. My biggest regret was that I didn't actually work on anything that made it all the way through to market. This is such as the nature of the business that things fail basically due to clinical trial results. So I haven't been able to say that I've actually worked on something that, that's made it all the way. But it was still very uh, a, a very worthwhile career at that point and very engaging. I did get a lot out of it. So the next decision point for me came probably around 2003. So I got the opportunity to relocate back to to Scotland. So being brought up in the, the, the west of Scotland, going to Strathclyde Uni, doing the hard part, moving down to, to Dartford, down the southeast, I had this opportunity to move back. And I did actually love it down there. I really enjoyed the time there. The people were great. The job was brilliant. But I guess at that point, you're a little bit older. Uh, my wife and I were about to have our first child. So some of the more personal circumstances start to come into play with some of the decisions. And we felt at that point that having that family network around us was, was more important. The other point I'd just like to make was again around sort of career decision. And again, someone pointed this out as almost like a why decision. So at that stage, if I was to progress into a more uh, a role with more responsibility in terms of leadership or project management, then the competition was high. There was a lot of um, high performing people within the team that I worked. The turnover of people wasn't that high. So it was likely the opportunities wouldn't come along that frequently. So it was almost like making a, a sidestep in order to, to make a, a progression as well. And there's no right or wrong. That That's a personal choice for everyone. Some people are, are happy to continue being that focused uh, scientist, uh, doing the thing that they love, and, 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 that, and that's okay. It's what works for you. So I guess a key learning for me was about the work-life balance and then that sidestep to move forward. So I moved to the Irvine site as a development chemist and I also spent a year on shift as a technical manager. So the roles that I took uh, at that stage were to basically transfer two products to the Irvine site. So a Tovacone and Zanamanvir. And you can see the, the basically the trade names Malarone for malaria and Melenza for uh, flu. So those were products that were being transferred to Irvine as part of a reorganisation with the operations team. So this is these are products that are now on the market. These are in full scale manufacture at other sites and are being transferred to, to Irvine. So as that chemist involved in the tech transfer, you're expected to be that subject matter expert. So everything that's associated with the process yield, the product quality, the environmental impact, that's all basically down to you. You're that key contact. The other key part is when you're bringing a new product onto site is that you have to commission it in a new plant. So you need to try and optimize it for your plant as it may be different. And the other thing is you have to bring the operators and the production staff uh, along the journey. You have to upskill those guys. You have to train them in that process. So that all comes down to the, the chemists and the commissioning teams that are involved in these uh, these processes. And a lot of times it's a 24-7 uh, manufacturing operation, so you do spend a lot of uh, time on shift. That came to my next uh, decision point, 2008. It was then an opportunity to move into a supervisory role. And this one kind of was forced upon me more than my choice at that particular time. And that was mainly due to the restructure that was about to happen on site. So the site uh, capacity and volumes were about to essentially be halved. So we're closing one of our uh, API facilities. So there was a an opportunity to move into a team leader role or basically take my chances in a pool of 18 chemists with three jobs. So the odds were uh, stacked pretty much not I wouldn't have got one of those jobs, but the option at that time, which certainly seemed the better option, was to move into the, the supervisory role. And this, again, was a big challenge, a new experience for me. It was my first uh, taste of working on 
fermentation process and also continuous extraction processes. A lot of the processes I'd worked on till that point had all been batch processes. So this was something that was completely alien to me as well. It was also the first time that I'd actually worked or moved into a process where I wasn't the, the expert. I wasn't that person who knew all the fine details of the process and was passing my knowledge. I had to go through quite a steep learning curve to, to get up to speed. And it was also a different role for me because I wasn't expected to be an expert, but I was there to actually lead the team of operators. So I had been involved in commissioning processes where I was a key contact for operators and directing them, but not necessarily actually leading and managing. And the big learning point for me at that point was that leadership is tough and I'll, I'll make no um, bones about it. To do it right it is tough. It does take a lot of time and investment to do it uh, properly. So that took me on to probably my fourth key decision point within my career. So I moved into what we call a GSK production system. So this is anyone who's ever had any experience of any manufacturing processes, it's all about continuous improvement. So any industry, any organization, they'll all have some kind of continuous improvement um, department, some kind of continuous improvement mindset behaviors. And at GSK, it was all about trying to drive to zero accidents, zero defects and zero waste. So essentially, if you were to drive all those things to zero, then you can produce your products more efficiently and cost effectively and of best value to the, the patients. And this was a big change for me because this was moving way out of my comfort zone. So this was moving away from science. This was moving into things that were more behavioral. It was more cultural. It's more about mindsets and how people act and how people work. So it gave me a really good chance to develop my transferable skills. So a lot of things around things like change management. So how do you bring change? How do you change people's ways of working? How do you change the the ways of working and mindsets that have been ingrained over a, a huge number of years to try and improve it. And that is very difficult. How do you influence people without necessarily having that authority? So you're not directly uh, responsible for them, but you still have to influence the way that they want to work. Communication's key. So how do you communicate to uh, the guys in the shop floor? How do you communicate to the senior management that your ideas are, are worth uh, investing? And then also coaching and facilitation. So key skills that you need in any type of organization. Probably one of the biggest uh, things that I got out of this part of my career, probably a highlight was being able to work with the McLaren Formula One group. Again, if you think about it, what the Formula One and drug development have in common, you probably say absolutely nothing. But once you actually start to distill it down into people and some of the cultural behavioral type things and McLaren philosophy is all based around innovation, continuous improvement and teamwork. Those are three things that you can take and apply to anywhere. And, and that was really fascinating to see how we could actually apply that at GSK and start to deliver some of the benefits to, to our process. The other thing that it did for my development was that it gained me more of an insight into other disciplines on and off site. So it increased my exposure and it gave me more um, interaction with senior leaders and also helped me move into a more senior leadership role within the site. So I guess the key takeaway that I would, I would say here is that basically don't be afraid to move out your comfort zone. Don't be afraid of the stretch. Don't put uh, the doubts in your head, the things that you learn over the years, the things that you do through your degree, so you can apply them uh, anywhere into any situation. So that takes me to my current role. So within the technical team, so over the last six years, I've had three of uh, the team leader roles within technical. So we now actually only have two teams due to restructure. So the, the two team leader roles we have in technical. So one is the day-to-day -day team leader role. 
uh, supporting operations and the the second one is the contingency improvement team so looking at the the business development aspect so i just want to highlight some of the the role some of the, the the type of roles that we have within the team so process chemists development chemists process engineers analytical chemists fermentation technologists strong links to microbiology a product owner is a chemist role but has strong links with our uh, quality department so analytical chemists in there as well and i guess this i would class as a as a high performing team so this is the team that's got high level of expertise and again we are really responsible for all the key technical aspects of the process so if anything goes wrong with the process then we're essentially the guys that work out what's going wrong and basically fix it and we're also there to try and drive the improvements and keep the process moving forward so i guess even though i'm managing a team of high highly skilled experts it's still a tough job so there's there's very little difference whether that's managing operational staff it is tough people are people at the end of the day we all have our own issues but again i'll just call it that it is is actually very rewarding and there's nothing more rewarding when you we actually develop your own team and see them go in and improve and, and grow their careers so that's all i want to say about the how we're structured i'm going to talk a little bit about gsk Irvin. so gsk Irvin's part of the the manufacturing arm of gsk so we're part of pharma supply chain and within that group we are part of the established product so the reason it's established product is that we make augmentin on site so augmentin's a 40 year old uh, antibiotic and gsk irvin is literally we are a world leader in that potassium clavulanate production so uh, potassium clavulanate and 6apa are the two main sorry not 6apa amoxicillin are the two main ingredients in augmentin so the Irvine site was opened in 1973 and 73 to 2011 we basically made antibiotics and other API intermediates. The site restructured in 2011 and that was part of the reorganisation I mentioned earlier. So we then started to focus mainly on our antibiotics business and then unfortunately last year we had a further downsizing where we lost the 6 APA process from the site. And that was basically due to, we weren't cost competitive with um, Chinese and Indian suppliers. So we are now a clavulanic acid site. So this is the, the GSK Irvin strap line. So we basically make clav safely, compliantly and competitively. And you can see the, the, the departmental structure there and where technical sits within that structure. So why does GSK Irvin, or why does GSK make Augmentin? So it's a 40 year old product, but essentially it's still highly profitable. So 60 doses of Augmentin are consumed around the globe every second. And the sales of Augmentin pre-COVID are around 600 million. So that's higher than our entire oncology portfolio put together. Those profits that we make from those sales get reinvested back into our R&D business, which help fund the innovation that the company is, is driving for. Another part of the, the reason is that potassium clavulanate is difficult to make. So that gives us a competitive advantage. So how do we make it? So you'll have heard uh, Alison talk about fermentation process earlier. So clavulanic acid is another fermentation process. So we start from Streptomyces clavulagerus. That's fermented to give us the clavulanic acid. And then we extract to the tertiary butyl amine salt and then convert that to the potassium salt. And then we have to blend it with excipient because the product's unstable. So that whole process, even though we're a one product site, there's still about 17 processing stages and that's before we take into account any solvent recovery or wastewater treatment so I'll quickly just run through the process in a little bit more detail so starting from fermentation so we start off with our support preparation which is down at the liter scale and then we scale up to 8,000 liters and then our fermenter scales is 
hundred thousand litres. So I thought that was big until I heard Alison talking about two and a half uh, million litres. So here is a picture of our fermenter hall. So we have 12 of these vessels and this picture down at the bottom right, you can actually see inside one of the vessel and someone carrying out maintenance. So they are pretty big vessels. They're about the height of four, uh, sorry, three double deckers high. And each one of these vessels will produce roughly 1,100 kilograms of clavulanic acid, which is basically enough uh, clavulanic acid for 8 million augmenting tablets. Once we've carried out the fermentation, we then need to extract the product. So it goes through quite a complex uh, filtration, concentration, and then purification stream. Top right picture shows here our ultrafiltration rigs. We have 10 of these rigs, which are kind of plate and frame uh, membrane technology, which allows us to process high quantities of broth uh, very in, in a relatively short period of time. And then bottom right is one of our counter current extractors, which again uh, allows us to extract into solvent high volumes, very relatively short period of time. And then just continuing that extraction process, we extract back into aqueous, isolate the intermediate salt, so your traditional crystallization, filtration and drying. And then we take the K salt, sorry, take the TBA salt and convert it to clav. And that gets uh, pre-mixed with a blend as it's unstable. It will actually thermally degrade if left in air. So that's all I want to say really about how we make clav. One of the things I just want to touch on now is basically how we continue to develop and try and improve the process. Again, even though it's only a, even though it is a forty-year-old process, we're still working hard to try and improve the process, improve the efficiency, and still trying to make uh, the cost of goods uh, cheaper. So the bottom left here shows the the clav tighter. So this goes be back to late nineties. What you see here is basically the impact that we've had from changing the strain of the, the clav uh, microorganism. So every, every time we have a change in organism, we've basically been able to increase productivity. So over the last 10 years, so around about this point here, we've actually seen an increase in productivity of around 40%. So that work is carried out by our uh, sister site down at Worthing. So the BPS team, which is the bioprocess uh, service. So that team there will carry out random uh, mutation screening. So we'll essentially take uh, 6,000 mutants on these uh, micro titer plates and we'll try and uh, basically randomly try and mutate the organism and try and come up with a, a new organism that's essentially more productive uh, in producing claves. So it will go through a scale up process into shake flasks and then eventually into 10 litre uh, fermenters. So we work very closely with the microbiology and the genetics team uh, down at Worthing. Following on from that, when we do start to identify any potential new candidates, we will then start to take those um, potential new strains through our new development facility at the Irvine site. So, we did just have a development facility at uh, Worthing that has closed. So we've now invested in our own facility to support that new uh, strain improvement. So here you'll see on the left-hand side, our, uh, the top one's our ultrafiltration facility. And then this one here is our reverse osmosis uh, concentration facility. And then this is our extraction uh, facility here. Over the next couple of years, we're also looking to invest in uh, more, more small scale fermentation in terms of lab capability and also uh, pilot plant uh, scale uh, fermentation. So within my own team, some of the activities that we are also uh, looking to do to improve the process. So the, the team that I have of chemists, process engineers and analysts, we are looking at using multivariate analysis. So we're working in collaboration with a company called Aspen. And that's how do we use the, the, the vast amounts of data to try and look at uh, variables within our process that we can control and try and optimize our yield and quality. We're also looking at 
looking at introducing electronic uh, batch records, so taking away all of the, the paper, which has a huge environmental impact and also a huge uh, quality and compliance impact as it can create a lot of uh, rework where people make errors in terms of filling in batch records, etc. So it takes away a whole host of uh, what we'd call data integrity issues. We're also looking to see where we can use analytics. So can we use instrumentation, so such as UV and conductivity in line to reduce any losses from our waste streams to optimize yield and the quality of the product. And we're also investing in new counter current extractors. So I have a process engineer who will be looking at using our uh, pilot facility to identify uh, new technology that we will uh, invest in our facility to upgrade it. So that's all I really want to say about our team. Hopefully that's given you a flavour for some of the careers and some of the type of roles that we have at GSK. I've copied in the website at the bottom uh, or the web address for more information on the careers. One of the things that I will point out is that GSK is about to go through a, a major transition. So over the next 12 months, we will be transitioning into a new biopharma company. So what does that really mean? And I guess none of us really know at this uh, stage what it, what it fully looks like. But essentially, it's looking at moving away from your what we call traditional small molecules to almost being a 50-50 split between small and large molecules. And I guess just to kind of highlight that, the little blue arrow with the, the circle there, that's aspirin compared to a, a large protein type structure. So that's what we mean by small and large scale molecules. There's also going to be a greater focus on digitalization, data and analytics as we really, really start to try and drive uh, performance into the, the, the new organization and the culture. So it is exciting times. And it, again, it's a, a case of watch this space to see what opportunities come out from from that, that big change. I'll finish off this little section just by talking a little bit about our future leader or our graduate uh, scheme. And this is open to graduates from any discipline. And it's a, a three year program where you get to do three one year rotations across any part of the, the business. And it's fast tracked through some of the type of leadership and transferable skill type uh, processes as well. And then at the end of that, the, the graduates are then fairly qualified to move into straight into a management role, but they're certainly well equipped to move into any roles within the, in the company, basically across the, the global organization. And then just finally, just to, to finish up, just a little bit on transferable skills and some of the things that I'm uh, looking for when I, uh, carry out recruitment and again just to point out the the box down at the bottom and I actually love this uh, this phrase here and I came across it when I was pulling these slides together that your talent will open the door but only your character can keep you there and I think that's really pertinent in particular when you you're starting off your career you, you've obviously you're building your expertise but a lot of the things that you've learned prior to your degree, during your degree, and will continue to learn after your degree are all shaped by your, your character, your personality, your behavior. And a lot of these things are, are transferable. And these things can open up so many doors, so many pathways into to different career options. So some of the things that I look for, teamwork goes without saying. I think you've got to be able to come into an organization, fit into that team. It's important to be an individual and contribute an individual, but the overall values within that team. I think determination is key as well. So I think there's there's very people with characteristics of determination. How do you respond to setbacks? People who know how to get jobs done, people that are the go-to person, I think are worth their weight in gold. How do you problem solve? What's your your logical thought process. And these are things that you'll pick up throughout your degree without any issue. Communication, whether it's verbal, whether it's uh, written. So as I said before, if you are trying to get operators on board to for your the change that you want to implement or you want senior management to buy into a funding proposal, then communication is key. And that's all really linked into that whole manage, management of change. And then natural leadership. So not only do you need leaders, 
in the team, but you need a, t- a team of leaderships that buy into a team of leaders that buy into the philosophy that you're trying to do. People that take uh, that ownership and personal development, I think, is really key as well. So you can people who want to keep improving, keep growing. So the learning doesn't stop once you've uh, once you've graduated. Uh, you continue to learn as you as you go through your career and you continue to to grow. And again, just to finish off there, that a lot of my colleagues uh, have started off as their careers as scientists and engineers, and have moved completely into different uh, disciplines. The, the the opportunities that it opens up, the as I say, the transfer transferable skills that it builds are absolutely second to none. And I say it certainly opens up a whole load of uh, doors for you. So just to finish off, hopefully I've given you a little bit of background to my career, some of the decision points and some of the type of roles, type of career at GSK. A couple of things just to finish on. So change is inevitable. It's inevitable in life. I think uh, the more that you guys can uh, accept change, embrace it, use it, control it, the, the better you'll, you'll be equipped. My advice to all of you would be to keep learning, keep moving forward, keep be curious, keep asking, why does that happen? Why do we do this? And really own your own development. And I know it's obviously difficult when you're just starting off your career, but I think if you, if you have a career path in mind, you have a goal in mind, then stay true to it. I think, uh, and steer your own pathway. And that would be my my advice. So just remains to say thank you for listening. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Gordon. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions for you before we go okay. to the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. So you had a very diverse role in terms of your collaboration that seems to require various skills from medicine development to Formula One. (laughs) So my question is, or this is a question from Jillia, how easy is it to change roles within the same company? Has it always been seen positively by GSK? Yeah, I think so. And I think I think it's one of the, the, the benefits of certainly working with a, a global organization. So I think, uh, as, I, as I try to point out, that the certainly staying within, obviously, R&D, um, I guess that's where I probably felt that there, w- there weren't many opportunities for change. I think you could move into a team leader type role or a project manager role. So it's very limited uh, within R&D. I think when you move into a manufacturing organization, then it starts to open up more avenues. And I think that's something that we really do encourage that diversity is really key. Different backgrounds bring different ideas. Uh, and I think it's the transferable skills and it's probably things that you won't even think about that you do and you can bring into different areas of the business. And I say it's is really encouraged um, and again what we are really uh, trying to encourage people is to think about their own development think about what areas they can prove within their own discipline but also what other opportunities are there that they can grow their own uh, transferable skills so yeah i'd certainly say it's encouraged within the, the organization okay yeah thank you very much gordon so there's the answer, Julia. Okay, so it is actually encouraged in GSK to go into different roles. Okay, so I'll open the uh, panel discussion. So I'll call Alison in as well. So we could answer the rest of the questions from the chat. Okay, first question is, is for Alison. How important is it working in other countries to an employee's experience and employability. Do you see this being more difficult after Brexit? Yeah, so for so from Ingenza's point of view, we're relatively small. Um, so a lot of our staff, I think one of the slides I had, had a picture of various different flags and I can't remember what the country count of where everyone was from. So we've got quite a diverse um, background of staff from various different places and a lot are from the EU 
So I'll be honest, we have concerns about Brexit. Will there be, will those people be able to come? Will, will, we, will we lose some staff? So yeah, that is, for, for a company like ours, that is a concern. It's probably fair to say that's probably true for a lot of science because a lot of what science is good at doing is collaborating. And we have a lot of collaborations within Europe and beyond. So yeah, I don't know how it's going to pan out. So it's a wait and see situation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I've got also a very related question to Gordon. So it's a, a question again from Lisa. So he, she was wondering if the graduate scheme also applies to other locations in Europe, for example, in the Netherlands. So I, I guess across, um, so as I said before, we are part of pharma supply chain. So there's about 80 sites across the globe as part of pharma supply chain. So that now the, the graduate scheme has broken down into um, disciplines. So for example, with process engineering, microbiology. So depending on which site um, is participating, it might limit some of the, the countries that you'll be able to apply to. But there are vast numbers of uh, countries that and sites across the, the, the globe that do participate in um, the grad scheme. It's also encouraged that people move uh, out of their disciplines. So if, if you're a process engineer, it's not advised that you just do a process engineering rotation, but you then move into maybe something that's aligned to some like project management or a, a secondary packaging site. So that you're broadening the diversity of your, your skills and your, your experience. Yeah, another uh, follow-up question from Heather, because you mentioned about manufacturing processes is, are any of these manufacturing or processing stages dangerous? If yes, how do you maintain safety? So uh, I guess for the Irvine site, so our products, we, we use ammonia in the fermentation uh, stage. So that's our most uh, toxic, uh, material on site. We also have an inventory of about, I'm going to say about, I'm going to say maybe about 10 million litres of solvent on site at any one site, uh, any one time. So if you think of the nature of those materials, highly flammable, uh, lots of moving parts, so lots of ignition sources. So safety is our number one uh, priority on site. So not only for the, the people on site, so it's important that everyone, site, everyone on site goes home safely and in the same condition they came to work, but we also have a duty of care to the, the surrounding environment as well. So we have to be very careful with any emissions, any spills, etc. So we are regulated by SEPA. Mm -hmm. We obviously have to apply to the health and, safe, health and safety executive guidelines. So there's a high uh, degree of control uh, measures that we put in place for, from a safety point of view, and they're always currently under uh, review, under scrutiny, and we're always trying to improve our safety records uh, on site. So uh, it goes with, without, um, without saying that, that safety is a top priority alongside the, uh, the quality aspect of the product as well. Yeah, I do see the same thing as well that safety is very important in any type of work we do. So I've got another question for Alison. Is industrial biotechnology going to play an important role in the future? Do you think the sector is going to grow rapidly? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think so. And, and you, can, um, you can take industrial biotechnology and apply it to lots of, of different areas. I mean, I think we've all, I hope that science and medicine as a kind of discipline and over the last year that we've been through that it maybe gets more people interested and, you know, people realize with the whole COVID-19, you know, what science can actually do and with all these vaccines, but specifically, you know, industrial biotechnology. Yes. I mean, if we want to feed the kind of, without going into the whole GM crop thing. But, you know, if we want to feed the growing population and we, we will have to think of innovative, innovative ways of doing stuff, of making things. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's lots of scope for, for, for biotechnology. I think 
companies have a responsibility to educate the public so that they're not scared of science and actually think of science as a good thing um, with all the medicines it can provide and the um, solutions that it can happen. So, yeah, I think so. Gordon might have some comments on that. Yes, Gordon, can you add something to that as well, please? I guess I'm probably late to the, the biotech party. Now, I guess being, I guess, traditionally a, a chemist, obviously synthetic uh, processes, lots of solvent. Probably my eyes were opened up with uh, the fermentation processes and the scales that fermentation processes and the complexity of the, the products that fermentation processes can certainly offer. Uh, and I think about what we do at Irvine where I mean, we produce, uh, I'm going to say about 700,000 kilograms of clavulanic acid all through fermentation processes. Now, if you think how you would do that from a synthetic chemistry route, it would be huge. One of the things where we are also looking at more as a, an organisation as well as more uh, biocatalysts. So particularly even with the uh, amoxicillin process, we're now looking at how we can use uh, a biocatalyst, which takes away high solvent uses, use of uh, dichloromethane, triethylamine. So we're using aqueous conditions, which are much more environmentally friendly as well. So there's, there's definitely huge uh, benefits. We do have a wastewater treatment plant, which is in itself is a big uh, bioprocessing operation, which takes all those waste products and converts them back into their uh, elemental components and we can generate heat and gas from, from those which feed our uh, plant processes as well. So I think it's a, a huge uh, opportunity and I think it's just getting the momentum behind it to, to essentially get it taken off and I think it's definitely the, the future without a doubt. So to continue on the topic of biotechnology, there's a question from Beth. What will be the best way to get experience in biotechnology, bioinformatics, data handling as a university student? So anyone, if you could answer that, Alison or Gordon. I, I can start, I guess. I, I think it depends on what the person asking the question is currently doing. So, you know, I don't know if they've got, if they're an undergraduate, they're doing a degree in something related or, um, so, it, it might be within the course that you're doing, you get exposure to this. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's hard to answer without knowing what the person um, is doing. So Beth is an undergraduate chemistry student. So again, I don't know. So some courses do offer, so we actually, so say University of Edinburgh, which is just down the road from us, we actually go, some of my colleagues go and give some, some lectures in kind of biotechnology and industrial kind of chemistry. So there is, in some courses, there, all, there already is um, some exposure to that. In other courses, there might not be. So I guess attending events like this and getting to meet people, um, actually getting experience, that is challenging because it's that whole, people want you to get experience to give you the job, but you need the experience to get the job, et cetera. Um, so we've had people that have come in and volu volunteered before. Um, like we had one guy came over, he was Spanish and his English wasn't that good. So he just came and kind of worked in the lab just to get some experience and improve his English. And actually he did that on a voluntary basis and then we ended up taking him on. Um, yeah, you just need someone to give you a chance if that makes sense. Or if you've got a chemist, I mean, I was a chemist once upon a time and then now I'm a microbiologist. So, you know, if you've got a basic science training in something, and as Gor Gordon said, if you, you're prepared to learn and diversify and read around the new subject and you've got other people there to help you, then, you know, you can do it. If you've got the interest and you're happy to do it, you could do it. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks, Alison, for that. Um, now we're going to the COVID situation. I think these you could answer, both of you could answer this question as well. So has any aspect of the processes had to change due to COVID? So I could, I could go first with that. So I guess for us, in terms of the process, nothing has changed. So it's still a 24-7 a manufacturing plant. So what we have done, though, is we have taken essentially... Or 
the essential people. Um, we've, we've tried to get a safe environment for those people. So the, the people, what we call the make, fix and test. So the operators who make the product, the mechanical instrument, electrical trades who basically repair and fix the equipment, and then the quality labs that test. So these are the, the key people that need to be on site. The rest of the people have all been working remotely. And, and that has been challenging as well because in my own role as a, a from a technical point of view, we're there to sort of over, oversee and govern the technical process, make sure the process is performing to its optimum condition, make sure the product quality is where it should be. So we've probably learned quite a lot. We've probably learned that we can do a lot of that remotely, but at the same time, we also need to have some presence on site as well when things start to mm -hmm. to go wrong so that's kind of how we've uh, dealt with it we've tried to create a safe bubble around those make fix test people and then have the other people sort of uh, either dialing in or coming on to site uh, but less frequently Alison yeah we've probably done similar in that when the first lockdown happened we, we didn't shut because we're, we're lab based we're practical so you mm -hmm can't do your job at home that's true. Um, so we the people that there's some roles within the company that people could work from home so basically the people that could work from home did and then within say so in my job I still I'm sometimes in, I'm in the lab and I'm like managing people so I would come in when I had to if that makes sense so probably maybe 50 percent of the time and then within my team we tried to split it that we didn't close contact ourselves so that you wouldn't have a situation that the whole fermentation group would shut and um, so um, and also in terms of we we separated out all the the desk space and we're quite lucky we're in a pretty big modern building so I think that helps with kind of air circulation um, I mean we're not a huge company and you know touch lots of wood that's been over a year and we've had no known cases of COVID at Ingenza um, in in the last year, which has been really good. And the whole PPE thing, as mm -hmm. scientists, we're used to kind of wearing PPE anyway. So the biggest difference, or it was just sort of adding on face masks. Yeah. That. And again, I think like the kind of directors or the senior management in, at Ingenza have realised that actually people can work from home more than they thought. And then it's potentially going forward leads to more flexible working, which I think for people's personal circumstance can work quite well. Like I, I've got a daughter, so being able to be a bit flexible and sometimes be at home and not waste an hour of travel or whatever in my day. Um, so I think going forward, I hope that, that, we'll go, that we'll go a bit back to normal, but not there'll be some learnings and good things from the pandemic. And I think that's true across all industries, not just just uh, science. Yes. So I think, yeah, there's the options of working from home due to the pandemic. <laughs> OK, one last question for Gordon. How does GSK Airvine cope with IP issues when concentrating on one specific older product? Sorry, I'm not quite sure on this. So the IP related to augmenting, so the, the, the product itself or in general. So augmenting's off patent now. If, yeah. if, if, it's, if it's specific to augmenting, uh, it's off, off patent. So augmenting was established in uh, 1981, so it's 40 year old. So it has been a long time off uh, patent. So one of the things that probably is, I guess, GSK's IP or our uh, secret weapon is the is the actual strain of the Streptomyces clavulogeris. So we, that's our real competitive example. So that mm -hmm. separates our, I'm trying to remember, I think maybe going back to about 2010, when we, we had a strain change and that shut off one of the metabolic pathways that basically increased our productivity. So that is our uh, real benefit, the, the real, um, that sets us apart from other players in the clav uh, business. Uh, so that's not something that's out there in the public domain. So it's not uh, patented, uh, it's a completely random 
uh, mutation. Uh, we're still trying to work out what the, I, th I think we're, we're working with the Paul Hosikins lab at Strathclyde Unit to try and understand the, the 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 gene sequence and all that stuff. So it's it's one of those things where we continue to improve, even though we're forty years old. We mm -hmm. still continue to improve, and it's all about that mindset. I continue to drive the, the business forward. So, despite of that, this is a follow-up question. What is the status of developing new antimicrobials for the pipeline within GSK? I think it's probably one that, I guess, if you look at across the whole industry, it's probably something that hasn't taken... Uh, there's been no major breakthroughs as yet. So I think anything that's out there is still very uh, early stage. I'm not aware of there's been anything that's near coming to market um, in the short term for, for GSK. I guess the other thing there is there has to be big investment and mm -hmm. there has to be the appetite for the, the drug companies. Obviously, as a, an organisation, we have a responsibility. Um, I guess we read more and more in the, the news about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so we as a company have to make sure that we are doing all the right things. All our emissions have to be thoroughly uh, tested so that everything's well within the, the limits of any um, waste streams and any uh, antibiotics going into the, the environment. So that's all ve under very strict controls. So we are currently working through a process of all our manufacturing sites to ensure that that's the case. So there's not much coming through the, the pipeline and I, I guess what will be interesting to see is once we start to move into the new biofarm company, how much of a focus uh, new antibiotics uh, will be. But I think it's almost something that I think is going to have to happen almost like what we've done with COVID. There has to be more collaborations across uh, companies, across governments to, to try and identify the next um, antibiotics. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much, Gordon and Alison. So I'm going to end the panel discussion and we'll move over to uh, Dr. Emma Compton who's going, it's a concluding talk about from the different careers that's possible for a science graduate. Okay, so Dr. Emma Compton leads the staff facing researcher development activities at the University of Strathclyde including delivering courses on career management for researchers. So she is also Strathclyde's institutional researcher development concordant champion. So she previously spent 11 years working as a biochemistry postdoctoral research associate in the UK and in the USA. So Emma? Thank you very much. Okay, I know that you've all been sat here through several talks this afternoon and the parts of them I've seen are really, really interesting. But And so I'm going to try not to give you give you broad detail today and not too much detail. There is some information on the slides that we'll send around as well. Um, I, as we, um, Luanne said, I lead our staff facing research and development activities at Strathclyde, but I also do a lot of career management for researchers. And I know there's a really broad audience today here. So um, I'm going to try and give you resources that will support everyone, but it means I can't necessarily go into detail across the board. I'm going to give you really some advice and framework for how you can approach your career development. I think you'll have noticed already from some of the answers, it's really hard to give really specific answers about careers and what you should go and do because the answers are just so broad. And so I'm going to try and give you a framework of how you can approach that and make that right for you. OK, so we're going to be talking about taking the next step and thinking about how you can manage your career and also what support's out there for you. I thought it would be helpful just to talk a wee bit about my own career timeline because it, I've been where all of you are. I've done, you know, I'm a biochemist. I'm not a chemist, but I'm a biochemist and my research always sat at the um, intersection of chemistry, biology and physics. And interestingly, some of the um, people that, uh, that um, Gordon's collaborating with, my old supervisor now works with at Strathclyde. So there's quite a lot of um, synergy between the, between the areas. So I did my undergraduate degree and my PhD in biochemistry back in Bristol some time ago. And then I did three postdoc positions. So I stayed at Bristol and I did, I stayed in Bristol, but my field changed quite significantly. Um, and then I moved out to the National, National Institutes of Health in America to do my second postdoc where my 
changed, stayed in the same field, but changed country, and then came back to the University of Dundee um, in 2010 for my third postdoc position. So overall, I was about um, 11 years in postdoc positions and 15 years in research. And this is just a picture of me in the time, just to prove that I really did that rather than the type of role I do now. This is me on the left um, with a PhD student at the time. And um, this is the type of research I used to do. I used to make pretty pictures of membrane proteins. Along the way, I got married and I had two children. And I always talk about this when I talk about careers because everyone makes career decisions based on their family, um, whether that's their partners, their children, their parents, their grandparents, their their friends who are as much family, everyone makes those decisions based on them. And it's really, really important to remember that when you're thinking about your career and value that just as much, because if that doesn't work for you in your life, you're not going to be happy. OK, so in 2014, I moved from research into a research developer role. And I talk about that like it's really quick and easy. And it absolutely wasn't. Um, that took years of doing what I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, about finding my options, understanding myself and really figuring out what was right for me. I then moved to Strathclyde in 2015, and I've been here ever since. Uh, my role's changed quite considerably as I've moved through that, because I spent that time, much more time than I did when I moved from my undergraduate degree, thinking about what I really wanted to do. I enjoy my job so much more now. Not that I didn't enjoy research, not that I wasn't good at it, I did, but not to the level that I do now, because I've thought about what really, really works for me. Okay, so what about you and taking the next step? I have put this slide in because I think this is what it feels like. This well in the middle when you're thinking about what jobs you might want to do that's what it feels like and that's absolutely fine and I'm going to give you a framework for working through that that by the end of it you should come out at the end with some idea of what you want to do and actually success in getting that job before I talk about that I really want to make sure you're aware of this theory of career development it's my favorite career development theory it's called planned happenstance so this means there's luck in all careers but you need to plan for it so if you just stay doing the same thing every day, talking to the same people, you're not going to have those chance encounters that will lead you to finding out about something that you're really interested in. So coming along to an event today is absolutely one of those activities where you can plan for luck to happen. Some of you will hear something today that clicks, that goes, that is what I want to do. Or maybe even that isn't what I want to do. And that's as important um, and put you in contact with those people. So it's doing things like this, getting out there and just seeing something different that will, is what leads to careers happening. And everyone, when you talk to anyone about their careers, they will talk about these incidents of just I just happened to bump into this person. It was just luck. And that is what will lead you to finding your four leaf clover. OK, so if we think about how are you going to take that next step? When I talk to researchers, I tell them to treat it like a research project. They, I see a lot of people who are all jumbled up in their head, don't really know where they're going or what they should do. But actually, and they think they should, they think they should know what they're going to do. But actually, when we talk about research, and if we treat it like a research project, it's much easier. You shouldn't know what your final career is going to be yet. Or maybe it depends where you are, but you shouldn't necessarily know that. If you're at the beginning of that, then you just need to find out what your options are. You need to kind of experiment with some ideas. You need to understand it better, analyse that, and eventually you'll get come to the right conclusion. You wouldn't go into a research project knowing exactly what the outcome is going to be at the end. You're going to go into it. Maybe you've got an idea, but maybe you get something completely different at the end. OK, so how would you do that? First of all, you need to research your options. And at first, you're going to start doing this with a really broad search. You're just thinking about the sector level you might want to work at. You know, you're here today to, listening to kind of industry careers. There might be other sectors that you want to look at as well. Just getting that sense of what's right for you. You need to research yourself. And this is really the most important piece. So if you understand what you're good at, what's really important to you, where your interests are, what your personality is like, that's what will really lead you to finding the right role for yourself. And I've put skills and knowledge at the bottom here because that's actually the bit that you can change. That's the bit you just learn as you go along. Really, it's the other pieces that are really quite inbred into you and inbuilt into you that you need that the better you understand those, the better you're going to understand what's going to really work for you um, in, your in your next job or your future career. And then the piece that supports that is the developing yourself. So I heard there were already some questions about what experience would I need? Um, and these answers can be really difficult to give because it's different for every role and it's different for every person. When you're at that broad searching stage, I would say concentrate on your transferable skills. And I'll talk about what they are in a minute. But they're the, the skills that underpin every role that we need in doing everything that we do. 
Um, once you get to that point and you've gone through that, you're probably getting to a point where you know much better what the types of jobs are, you know, what sector you might want to work in, what type of roles. And that's when you're going to really start doing a much more refined search about actually what jobs are really out there and what can I apply for. And that's when you might start topping up your specialised skills and knowledge with actually getting the experience or, you know, as you're saying before, just about learning about that area so that you can you get that 80 percent of from your transferable skills and from the degrees that you're doing, but then it's really topping up that specialised skills and knowledge. So how do you go about researching your options? Um, so talking to people. If there's one thing that comes away from today, it's talking to people. They will have so many more ideas than you'll have on your own. So make use of your career service. So if you're undergraduates here, um, um, whatever university you're at, you'll have a career service and you'll be able to make use of it. Most postgraduates will. Um, it's Strathclyde, our, our, if you've got any postdocs here, you can't necessarily talk to our career service people, but you can come and talk to us. Um, and I'll give you some other places you can go to look, but you can also make use of their resources online. If you are doing a research project, talk to your supervisor, talk to the academics around you, talk to your family, talk to your friends. Um, but it's really that planned happenstance. Go places where you're going to bump into people who can really talk, um, talk to you about this. And be curious and open. Don't make assumptions. It's really easy to go, oh, I don't want to do that because of, but you've never actually asked the person. I see so many people telling me I want to stay in academia because I love problem solving. I don't think there's a job out there that doesn't have problem solving in it, but we make a lot of assumptions that that it, the other jobs don't have what we want in them. Um, and the, there's lots of resources out there. So, you know, again, your career service, start maybe looking at job adverts, lots of general web pages out there, web pages about different careers. And again, it's really that taking opportunities, you know, the planned happenstance, attend events like this, join groups and committees where you get exposed to different people that might open up opportunities for you. You'll see on some slides, I've got a list of resources and I'm not gonna talk through these, but these are for when you get the slide pack, there's some, some resources that might help you in these areas. So you've taken, you've, you've taken one of those planned happenstance steps today. So I'm not just gonna give you a framework, I'm gonna give you a bit of detail as well. One um, thing I wanted to talk about was talking about roles inside and outside of academia. So I work with a lot of um, researchers and a lot of postgraduate researchers, and the majority of them tell me they want to be academics. And we know nationally that most want to be academics, um, and the numbers just don't work. There aren't the number of roles, and I think this is quite a useful slide. So this is a study that was done about 10 years ago, looking at where do PhD students go. Um, so if we take 100% of PhD students on the left, after they leave their PhD and move into what they call early career research, which is a postdoctoral research position, more than half leave. So at that point after PhD, more than half of people leave academia and go into non-science roles. About half stay in science roles with about 17% going into non-university research, so industry research, and about 30% stay in academic research in postdoc positions. Then when we get towards the end of postdoc positions, so they tend to be fixed term positions and people tend to not be able to do that for more than 10 or 11 years for lots of reasons, then actually we see the majority of people leaving academia and going into non-academic roles with about 3% of our total PhD students staying in academia. So I think this is just really useful to um, you help you with those expectations of where the roles sit and thinking about where lots of people go. Because although most people leave academia, we know that those who do, um, most, are most, are unemployed, wrong around, most are employed, unemployment's really low in people. Um, even at university and most and they tend to move up through um, leadership positions quickly. Okay and so just a little snapshot of kind of where do our well, these are really where our chemistry PhDs at Strathclyde go this is a selection of some of our graduate statistics um, with some job title names on them and this is the type of thing to look at just start thinking about those if you don't know what they are um, go away and do some googling and just find out what it is um, so there's lots of different things in there. We've got chemistry teachers, we've got patent attorneys, we've got postdoctoral ro roles, um, research chemists, scientists. So there's things in there you would expect and there's things in there that you might not expect. And on the right hand side is the list of all the um, companies that they have gone to work for or universities they've gone to work for. This is the type of thing to just start doing a bit of research, broad search, finding out what's out there. I also wanted to point out this website, which is, um, uh, website focused more on researchers of people who've, you know, if you've done a PhD or your postdoc position, um, where it's a, on the Euraxis website. So Euraxis is a European organization that supports researchers. Um, 
and they looked at the different sectors that researchers have gone into and they looked at the different occupations that researchers have gone into and so this is a really good website to give you some um ideas about that and you know we can see this, this is a broad range of researchers not necessarily just from a chemistry background but they're going into a few places you'd expect so maybe life sciences um energy and mining then we've got management consultancy we've got charity and third sector and then when we look at the occupations again we've got um, you know, things that you might expect, engineering professional, health professional, but search and grants manager, so that would be working in a university, we've got functional managers, teaching professionals, and this website can really help you start to unpack what some of those, um, those roles might look like. Okay, so that's the researching the, you know, what are your options, then thinking about researching yourself, um, and so this is really, you know, thinking about what are your strengths, what are you good at, and if you're you, ideally, you want to go into a role that really plays on what you're good at, because that's how you're going to ex you, um, excel and that's how you're going to succeed and be really happy. Think about your values, so what's important to you. So I know someone who came out of a, um, a microbiology PhD and went to work for a tobacco company. That didn't gel, that didn't have a problem for them with their own values, but I know other people who actually would have had a real issue with going and working for that sort of company. So really think about what matters to you. Think about what your interests are because actually you know, what is it you want to be doing a job that, that really interests you and think about what your personality is so when i was thinking about what to do moving out of research one of the reasons i really wanted to move out of research was i wanted to work with people more i worked really close with my colleagues and that was great and i'm still friends with many of them and i still work in a team of, of close colleagues but i really wanted to be working with more people you know a bigger broader range of people and I absolutely get that in research development. And that is, you know, that's one of the parts of this that I really enjoy. Um, and you might be sat here listening and going, yeah, that sounds brilliant. And you might be sat here listening and thinking that just sounds awful. I never want to talk to people. And that's the bit about understanding yourself and understanding what different roles might involve. And then there's the understanding your skills and knowledge. And it's important to know what your skills and knowledge are so that you can know how you match with the job. But as I say, that's the bit that really you can, um, you can kind of top up and you can change over time. Because I know we've got a really broad audience here, how we would be supporting you at different stages is a little bit different. So I'm not going to go into much detail here. But for those of you who are in research positions, there's a there's a MOOC around um, career management that does quite a lot of this that you might find helpful. Um, and the link's there. Then if you're an undergraduate, you I would absolutely be looking at your, actually for anyone, I'll be looking at your career service at Strathclyde. Our career service have got some really good tools um, for, around exactly this. And I'm sure you're, if you're not at Strathclyde, your university will. PhD students at Strathclyde, we've got the Researcher Development Programme that in, contains courses and activities around this. Um, and for our postdocs, you would be coming to us in OSDU, where we also do a lot of work around this. And for those of you who aren't at Strathclyde, you will have equivalents in your university. OK, so we're here. You're doing your research, researching your options. You're researching yourself all along at the same time. And then you're also thinking about developing yourself to making sure that you've got the skills and the knowledge and everything that you need to be really competitive when you apply for a job. So in terms of transferable skills, you know, what does that mean? And this, this is the things you're already doing. So this list is endless, but this is just some examples. These are things like project management, team working, your communication skills, so verbal communication skills. Are you doing talks? Are you talking in presenting in meetings? Your written communication skills. So that this is you know, if you're in a research position writing papers, but it's writing essays. I still take the the principles that I learn to write essays, and I use them when I write the types of papers that I'm writing now. Um, so it's developing those skills from an early time. Your your leadership skills, your self motivation. So this could go on and on, but you're you'll be doing this in whatever you're doing at the moment. And it's also about using that planned happenstance, finding the opportunities where you can continue to practice these. So it's, you know, making sure that you take opportunities when you can to give talks. And I, I say that as someone who used to avoid doing every talk I could possibly do when I was at university. I used to run away from them and now it's pretty. Um, and that came to actually forcing myself to practice doing it and finding the opportunities that I was comfortable with in doing that. So that's your transferable skills. So now you're doing that, you're researching your options, you've got a better understanding of the sectors, you know what um kind of what's important to you you understand yourself better and this is i should say this is a continuous process through your life as well um this you know you will keep doing this and understanding it better but you're developing your transferable skills and now you're getting to that point of actually you know what sector you want to work in and you're starting to really look at what jobs there are and really to think about those specialized skills 
Um, and so how do you do this again? So again, it's talking to people, you know, it's really the same as before, but now when you're talking to people, it's much more focused. So I'd recommend you do what we call informational interviews. So finding people who work in the types of places that you'd like to work in the types of roles you think you might be interested in and asking them about what they do. Everyone is happy to talk about themselves. Um, it can be terrifying asking them to do that, which it shouldn't be, but it can be, but just saying, you know, would you have time for a chat so I can learn a bit more about this? It's really, really effective in finding out, does a role sound like that you'd be interested in it? Or actually, does it sound like something that you'd not be quite so interested in? And that both are just as important. Again, you're talking to your career service, so they'll be able to help you with CV writing skills, with interview skills, um, and the planned happenstance sits here. So that, you know, getting out to places to just bump into people and finding out things like coming along today, you've heard so much about different roles and different aspects of, of industry. Um, and it's doing more of that, just finding the people and, you know, taking, keeping it in your mind and that being curious. I've been at conferences and just said to someone, oh, can you just tell me a bit more about what you do? Because I'm thinking about what my next role is. And it's those types of conversations that will really help you. You're then going to start using your resources in a much more effective or much more um, focused way. So, you know, looking at the companies really quite in detail. What type of roles do they offer? Maybe for, you're watching their job adverts, what's coming up? And spending some time getting used to the job adverts um, they can take a bit of skill to read them and i'm going to go through one just in a minute to help you with that but you know getting familiar with out there what are the job titles called everywhere uses different job titles um, and getting a sense so that you recognize what it is that you'd be looking for and still taking those opportunities you know attending events joining groups and committees going to places where those people will be you know, are there events that you can attend where they would be? Or if you're joining a group or committee, can you invite them in to come and talk about what they're doing so you get to know them? So I said I'd talk a wee bit about job adverts. Um, so reading a job advert can take a little bit of skill. I thought it might be useful just to talk through where the important points for you are. So all this is, I just pulled this off the internet yesterday. I just went to jobs.ac.uk and looked at jobs under chemistry. And this is the first one that came up. So it is an academic focused position rather than an industry focused position. But what they, the structure and what they have in the adverts generally is the same wherever you're looking. So usually there should be something that tells you the job title and something that will indicate the grade and probably the salary. That can be different everywhere you're working um, and might take a bit of research to figure out what it means. This is essentially a postdoc position that someone straight out of a PhD would be able to apply for. So you'll always get something that tells you about the context of the institution or the organisation that you're working for. They'll tell you what the purpose of the job is and they'll tell you what the duties and the responsibilities of the person employed in the role is. The bit at this point you're really interested in though is the person's specification because this is the bit that tells you what it is they're looking for that you need. Um, and you, person specifications tend to be um, organized like this with qualifications, experience, knowledge, they might not be the exact words, but that tends to come first, then skills and abilities, and then kind of pers then personal attributes. Um, sometimes that's hidden away in the text. It's not put clearly like this in the table. It's quite often though it's clearly put in a table. The key here is that everything essential is what you will need um, in order to get through to an interview stage. So um, Quite often what will happen is that a shortlisting panel will look at the um, look at those essential criteria and they'll score them on a zero to three scale. So zero is doesn't meet expectations, one is meets expectations, two is no, one is below expectation, two is meets expectations, and three is above expectations. Um, and you need to score a one on all the essentials to get in. So if you don't address it in your job application, you'll get a zero. But if you address it but not well, you'll get a one and that will allow you, usually allow you to get through to at least being long listed and then they may have to make the list short. Um, but I think this is where you really want to be looking and you'll see here, you know, the, there are some distinct qualifications, but there are some really broad pieces in here, those transferable skills. So the ability to prioritise among different tasks, ability to work effectively in groups effective communicator in written and spoken media. And I wrote the slide with the transferable skills before I'd even seen this job advert, but there's so many things that come up really predictably that you can pull those out and work on those. And then, then it's about filling in the specifics so that, you know, here is an understanding of thermodynamics, right? If this is something you don't have, you can go away and read that up on that and learn about it. That's where you start really focusing in on the specialist skills. Um, but this I would definitely recommend looking at job adverts and really focusing in on this person's specification to understand what skills you'll need for different roles. Okay, so 
I'm coming towards the end of this, um, just to really summarize or to start summarizing. So, you know, it's about researching your options, researching yourself. So you know what's out there, you know what, what's right for you and re then developing those skills for you. Um, bear in mind that planned happenstance all the way along. And then the other I'm going to add into this is really developing your network. I've alluded to that as we've gone through um, that, you know, this is all about people and actually that network is what will, will really support you as you go through. OK, so you've got to the point now where you're really quite confident, you know what it is you need to do. So how do you actually find that job that you want? So this is where you use that network. So your network will really help for you raise, raise your profile. Um, your, your personal and professional networks that you'll have developed as you've gone through this. Um, and you tell people that you're looking for a job. People, if you say you're looking for a job, people love to say, have you thought about this? Some things will be way off, some things will be spot on. Um, there's the getting some experience and recognizing the experience you've already had. So we've talked about that in you looking at the skills that you need. And it's a really important point to recognize you don't you have 80 percent of it already. Probably it's about just popping up some of the, the bits in between. Um, LinkedIn can be a really, really good place. I haven't mentioned it already, but to think about building a network that can be a good place to start um, linking up with people and to do a bit of that research about what do people do. Um, people tend to put a good, quite a good job description of what they do on there. When you're searching for advertised roles, there's lots of places to look. Um, here are some broader ones and some more chemistry focused ones. I'm not going to go through them, but you can when you get the slides, you'll be able to go through them. And you can also consider using recruitment agencies who can try to you know, match you up with roles. Um, when you're applying for a job in itself, you know, it's coming back to that research that you've done into yourself and making sure you really research the employer in the role so that when you write your CV, it's really, really focused on that particular employer um, and the same for your cover letter as well. You'll be wanting to think about whether you're writing a chronological skills based CV. If you're if you're applying for academic roles, academic CVs look really different to non academic CVs. Um, so and that's really important if you're used to writing an academic CV and you're right, looking for a role outside of academia, make sure you get really familiar how to write a non academic CV. They're very, very different. But you'll think about, you know, when you're doing that, do you talk about your um, experience in terms of, of the time, so chronologically, or more on the skills? And the, both exist, and there's hybrid ones. And that might be something to talk to your career service and people who are in roles as to how, what's the most effective there. You want to really think about tailoring your own profile within that. So making sure that what your the employer is reading really fits what they're asking for. So you change the language to using the language that they're using. They want to see that, they re that you understand and want to work for them. And this isn't just a generic CV that's been put in. Um, and using really relevant headings. And you'll find that you probably have a standard format of a CV, but that it changes for each employer that you're applying to. And again, there's just some resources and some CV templates that can be really helpful there. And just as I, I come to finishing up, this is a, a slide that I've let's say borrowed from one of the career service, one of my colleagues in the career service that I've done this talk with before about some kind of employers views on CVs. So this is someone talking about the contract research industry, think it's very fast paced, line driven on a daily basis. This is focused at very high levels of first apprenticeship. It should be noted this is not a good fit for everyone. We look for clues on CVs that the candidate is a good fit for this kind of environment. So that's the purpose of the CV. They know what environment they have and they should express it quite clearly in their job advert and so but sometimes they might not so it's also about understanding what that is and talking to people about that um so they, you know use your cv for that um when it comes to writing a cv i'd recommend a phd applicant focuses more so this is for those of you who are in phd research positions a phd applicant focuses more on the soft skills they can offer and the fundamental the fundamental technical skills they can bring rather than their niche skills that might not immediately benefit the business so that's about you know you've got all these transferable skills you've got quite a lot of skills it might just not be quite in the the research focus area and i think most people move fields in some way during their career and just this, this warning from them on occasion we see cvs from phd applicants that read like a mini thesis this can help us gauge how well this individual would fit into the role and can result in the person not being entered into the recruitment process so you know that your cv is the gatekeeper to letting you into the recruitment process so it needs to be really really clear and i would recommend just getting people to read over it getting some help with this um, to because what you, sometimes what 
you can't see the wood for the trees in there and making sure that what you're trying to say comes across really clearly. So I know we're coming to the end now and what I really just want to leave you with is, um, you know, we've talked about how giving you a framework of thinking about um, researching yourself, researching your options, um, and then developing yourself and some tips about how you would actually approach applying for roles. But just remember this planned happenstance because this is it, get out there, talk to people and the opportunities will come to you. Thank you very much, Emma. You gave us really very good tips there and how to uh, go into what's next into our career. Okay, I have one scenario here. So this is from Marta. So her main question is how are lab skills of applicants assessed? So she's a standard chemistry undergraduate student with all its labs, but she's very interested in computational chemistry. So all the extra projects and internships she has already done, but then she has an issue. She would like to apply for a position of a synthetic chemist role. So what will be your advice? I think I think you probably know from the talk, but go and talk to people in those roles. See if you can find some people. I talk to your career service because they might well have some good advice on that as well. They might have come across this before. Um, but finding people who are, you know, see if you can use your network to find people, your supervisors um, or, you know, the academics that you're working with who might be able to put you in touch with people who are in those, um, in those positions. But you can... Quite often on a job advert, it will have can you a name to contact, and I would contact them and just say, look, I've got a question. Would you be able to help me with this? The worst answer you're ever going to get is is to ignore you. You know that's you the someone's either going to help you or not reply to an email. So I would just say, you know, use that as a way. If you can't find someone through LinkedIn or through your network to ask, perhaps look at some of job adverts and email them. Thanks. Um... Emma, another one is, how can you increase your chances to pursue a PhD as an undergraduate besides getting a first? That's a question from Lisa. So she just finished her third year BSc. Okay, um, again, there's probably lots of different answers to that one. And so again, I would be looking at, so, so jobs.ac.uk is brilliant for advertising PhD positions. I would definitely be going and talking to your um, you probably did a research project during your um, during your undergraduate degree, talking to your supervisor from that, telling people that you're interested in doing it, talking to people who've gone and done other PhD positions. Um, the answer is going to be different for every PhD, but I would you know, use that network again and talk to them and use the have a look and just see what are they asking for in to, you know in adverts for PhDs and get familiar with the the processes of recruitment and how they're recruited for as well mm -hmm. there are some where you apply directly to a person and they might have a single project or there might be where you apply to uh, a program and then there are different PhDs within it okay so networking is very important yeah, that's always my answer. <laughs> always my answer. I just need it tattooed across my forehead. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Emma. And I would like to thank all the speakers, Alison and Gordon as well. So it is, it's really a very inspiring afternoon. So I'd also like to thank the participants for coming to this, um, again, inspiring webinar. And to conclude, as a science graduate, it, said it is very important to see that multidisciplinary, and I, I want to add to that, networking seems to the seems to be the key word that is always a career for you out there and choose a career that, career that will make you happy. Good. Thanks, everyone. And I wish you a nice afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, Grant.